Hello there and welcome to the Irish Film London podcast. I'm Neve Brannigan and I am joined with the head of Irish Film London, Jerry Maguire. And we are going to chat to you about all things film and TV before kicking off a great interview today with rising star Neve Algar. So Jerry, how are you this week? Not too bad, Neve. How's things your end? Good, good. It's quite actually an exciting day today because we've just gone live with our tickets for our August screenings, haven't we? We have indeed, yeah. So the first Irish Film London cinema screenings since, I guess, November 2019. So a while back, a while Amazing. back. Yeah, but we've managed to get some some screenings lined up for our, for the month of August um, at two cinemas in London, at the Rio Cinema in Dalston in East London and at the Bertha Dock House, which is the UK's only documentary only cinema. Uh, oh, like, amazing. It's a dedicated documentary cinema it's at the Curzon Bloomsbury so if you are familiar with the Brunswick Centre and the little underground cinema down there that's where the Bertha Dock House is um the Rio probably needs no introduction on Kingsland High Street um but yeah we're really exciting like we're managing to get four great Irish films Irish feature films into the cinema for people to catch up on and a range of new Irish short films as well it's and the, what, what documentary is going to be shown in the Bertha Dock House so we have got Songs for While I'm Away, which is Emer Reynolds' uh, biopic of Phil Linnett of Thin Lizzy fame. And then across in the Rio, we're showing The Eighth again. So as people who listen to this podcast will know, we have been trailing The Eighth online for a long time, but we finally got a chance to put it into the cinema. And we're also showing Wolf Walkers, and we're showing uh, David Frayne's second feature, Dating Amber. And then uh, on the 22nd of August, we've got, uh, on the Sunday, the 22nd, we've got uh, a range of short films that we're showing there as well. So most of the stuff's over in the Rio, but um, Songs for Well and Away is in Bertha Dock House and deserves your attention as well. Oh, that's so exciting. So exciting to be hosting screenings again, and especially of a lot of films. I know during the week we were talking about Irish films that may have gotten missed yes. throughout cinemas being open and closed and... Exactly. premieres and screenings and all that kind of stuff so it's nice to kind of be able to give some of them a chance to be screened again for sure it's brilliant yeah it's brilliant and it's just so exciting to be back with with an audience in a real real cinema <laughs> like you mm, know absolutely. watch parties on watch parties online are just not the same no not at all actually one watch party that i did solo this week i didn't get to the cinema but i did get to see a sneak preview of censor before my interview today with neve mm. and all i will say is i don't want to say too much but all i will say is that you're definitely in for a treat if you're into the thriller genre genre horror genre i've just made up a new word horror genre. and genre genre I like it. Um, genre it's definitely <laughs> um a very new kind of fresh perspective uh, on that genre so definitely go and check it out but also this past week has been the um announcing of the nominations for the Galway Film Fla. Yes so the full program for the FLA is finally out um they were kind of keeping it under wraps for a long time because it's taking place this month isn't it and yeah at the yeah. end of yeah I think the 20th it's starting on the 20th That's of right. July yeah 20th to 25th and they only made their announcement there last week or, or in the week gone by so um I suppose like everyone they're keeping their cards close to their chest until they knew what was happening with restrictions on being able to let people in the door and all that kind of stuff but exactly and I think even like for people who are listening over in London they are doing some in-person screenings but they're doing a lot still online as well so yes you can definitely check out there's some amazing shorts I know that Bow Street um do a actor creator scheme a funding scheme so there's some amazing actor creator um, shorts that are going to be on. I know there's um, some of my recommendations, mm. uh, not biased at all. Some of my friends, but there's Foxglove by Clara Hart um, Rest in Jellies um, with Gemma Kane. There's also a short film called Spirit Level, which Tony O'Rourke is in, who was on our podcast oh, there yeah. last week, chatting about all things self-tape. Um, and then we also have a short film called Boogaloo. I think I got it right with <laughs> our patron Mo Dumford. Yes. Um, and then also, you know, I'm just going to slip in there as well. Yours truly is in a short called The Cave. Um, oh. Cave, should I say, by Dermot Malone of Banjo Man Films. So plenty uh, of shorts there for people to check out online. But there's a few features that are going to be um, there as well. 
there's a few there's a few really good features like i mean you know for a, a late announcement they really knocked the program out of the park i think um i believe their opening film is a thriller called here before which features andrea riseborough um so that's a psychological thriller and anything with andrea riseborough i'll be interested in watching anyway she's a great actress um there is an irish language film um by the name of fosca um with donal o'haley of arak film um mm. their closing film is a documentary called untold secrets which covers the mother and baby home stuff um and there's another um really quite interesting documentary by mark cousins called the story of looking which they've got as well the story of looking is one of mark's releases this year mark cousins is a filmmaker who tends to like just go into this period of like intensive filmmaking and then intensive releasing of films. Mm. So he's got like the story of looking is coming out now and it's doing um, some festivals and doing hopefully some, um, some cinema releases and stuff. And then there's another TV series of his that's coming out and probably something else. Amazing. He's prolific in a good way. Amazing. And also I think as well, there will be a either in person or online. I'm not hundred percent sure screening of sensor as well. There is. That's right. So I think that leads us nicely into handing over our listeners to our interview with rising star Neve Algar. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Neve. Okay, hello and welcome to the Irish Film London podcast. Neve Algar, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Neve. It's a pleasure to have you on. And I just do want to know for our listeners that Neve is in the middle of a serious amount of press at the moment and also most likely in between shooting. So we're very lucky that you got to slot us in. It's always nice to have a BAFTA and if the nominee on our podcast. Um, but Neve, <laughs> I want to chat to you about so many different things because you've worked on and are working on so much amazing stuff. But let's do a little recap. Um, let's go right back to when it all started and uh, when you knew, yeah, this is this is what I want to do. Um, well, I was born and I'm yeah. <laughs> right back, I'm gonna right, right, right back. How many hours have you got now? <laughs> <laughs> um, God, when to talk about. So, uh, I suppose that I grew, I grew up in the countryside and I was the youngest of five kids. So I found myself, I suppose, getting lost in the world of TV and film as a, as a way of educating myself or exploring different culture and and different characters and I suppose that possibly was like a seed in why I'm so interested in in acting because it's the idea of just understanding more about each other um but yeah I just I like every kid possibly you know getting involved in in youth theater and um there's a place called the art center in Mullingar and they used to put on like these what felt like at the time when you were a kid were like these high-end West End productions and you know every everyone would go and see them at Christmas that were, that was in the town and um I was largely involved in that but yeah I told my parents I wanted to be an actor but it was the usual kind of like okay <laughs> that's crazy and you know let's let's see you know where they usually do that thing of like let's see where your strengths are in school and for me it was like music art English um, I was terrible at maths and languages, so naturally, there you know, it's like let's 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 see if we can apply to some of the the art schools. But um, that was it. And I, I I went off to DIT, and it was while I was there, got involved in in the in the drama societies. But my friend Nicole was studying drama at Trinity, and so I would try and like just go over to her college <laughs> and try and like sit in on some of crash. the yeah just be like they won't notice me if I just <laughs> play along um yeah and I was so jealous the fact that she was you know she was off studying English and and drama um and then while I was in college I uh, started working as a production runner for a production house in Dublin that was actually uh the main production house for the Savage Eye, which is on RT, and got got a got a job as a um, production buyer for the art department, and was there for about a year, just like part time while still in college and learning 
it was great because I was in and out of the office and on set on a weekly basis. So I learned about the process of film, or sorry, of TV production from script to screen just by, you know, being there and, um, and then eventually got involved in theatre and did my first film with the Lorcan Finnegan, which is a debut feature called Without Name and went to the Toronto Film Festival and on my way back from Toronto, stopped off in London, uh, stayed with a friend, um, Polly Reed, and met with agents and finally met with my agent now uh, and moved there. I kind of didn't really come back. <laughs> I just kind of stayed. Yeah, your mom and dad are still wondering where you are, Neve. I told them I was back in five minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I came home for the pandemic to pass and I'm still sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was their plan for me. They wanted me to stay. During during the during the lockdown, they got too they got too comfortable with me being at home. But that it's exactly as you say though, like you only you really only do learn by being on your feet. It's like a language, like you only really learn if you're in the country that speaks it. You know, you only really learn your craft yeah. when you're surrounded by, you know, people who are doing the same, like minded people, or and when you're pushed into things, you know, it's yeah. and it's a real kind of active thing as well. Kind of just fake it till you make it. You know, if you if yeah. you don't know what you're doing, it doesn't matter. Just keep going, kind of thing. Yeah, well, that that's what it felt like. It was I like I moved out of Mullingar and into Dublin, um, and then you, I think you just naturally gravitate towards finding your tribe, and and for me it was you know like actors, and I was like ah oh, I, I get this I get this language you understand this. And so there was the first time where you finally feel like you're being your true self. And I think that's the, that's the drug, you know, of, of being able to sit comfortably with yourself. And I think that once I figured that out, it all, everything kind of began to make sense and you kind of understood what it is that you should be fighting for. And, and, um, yeah, but like Jeannie Mac, like I, I, I worked on like this week in the press, it's been funny because everyone's like, and you know, you know, you just, you got very lucky, didn't you now? And you're just, you have all these projects coming out now at the moment. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, no, no, you, you just, you just don't lie. You just walked out. I just, know, just walked kind of out decided like, one day, yeah. I'll give this a go. Yeah, That's just what I was going to move on to because your success, that's exactly what I was going to say. It hasn't come out of nowhere because you you are such a hard worker and you've done your fair share of short films and smaller yeah. parts on TV shows and in feature films. And then you got bisexual and then pure. Well, no, it was it was the first was actually it was it was virtues. Virtues just oh, wow. took so long from when we actually shot it to when it came out. Like it took about two years from when I think I was cast in it. So I got cast in it in oh crikey. Was it 2016 or 2017? But then it didn't yeah, 2017, but then it didn't actually come out until 2019. Exactly, because mm. on the, obviously, like, your IMDb and stuff, it's like 2019, 2019, yeah. 2019. I'm like, is there enough yeah. months in the year for this <laughs> lady no to shoot that. all of these amazing yeah. things? So that obviously would make sense then with kind of just, and especially recently, which is kind of pushbacks and holes on productions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um. So it was vir Virtues first. And Choose then... First. Then the bisexual. Then. I shot the bisexual and pure uh, at the same time. Oh wow! Um, so that was and they because they were both um, Channel Four productions. So they were really lovely about you know trying to make a schedule work. You know, mm. production companies are they understand that you're you're you know you need this is like you need to be able to feed yourself and they're not going to hinder you from trying to get other work. So um, the two production companies kind of worked out amongst them and luckily. They're both filming in London at the same time. So, yeah, I shot them coincide and then came off the back of them to do Camel's Horses. All I know is that like, <laughs> since I cut my hair, like since Shane cut my hair, then that haircut kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> continued That's your on. timeline is your hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it kind of continued. And then, you know, so each production would be like, no, we really like the undercut. And I'm like, really, do you? Because I was thinking about... <laughs> thinking about growing it out <laughs> yeah a mother father son uh, came directly after um cam with horses so i never in the, all those five years i never had a rap party because i was always going from oh wow one 
one show to the next. So one day I'll get a rap party. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not a bad complaint, but absolutely. No. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, what was it like kind of juggling all those different projects and then kind of them all coming out then at the same, well, not at the same time, but, you know, kind of one after another? It was re- it's really, I like, I found it so exciting. You know, the, I'd gone from waiting to work to like working on on a numerous numerous projects at the same time so I feel felt like I was prepped to do that because you're you're just chomping at the bit and trying to and trying to actually you know do the acting um it's like I heard that saying it's like someone who was going in to do audition tape or into the room to do an audition they weren't nervous it was the fact that they were just excited to go and actually be given the opportunity to act for 20 minutes in a room and I think once I heard that I was like oh okay so there's no difference between really what your body's going through for excitement or nerves it's just you're 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 excited to have this experience and to just do what you're you know what you're learning and trying to do um and so I think it's only now that I'm sat in a quarantine hotel that I kind of go right this is the first time I've had time to really decompress and stop and just kind of take note of of the the jobs because when you're in it you're not really you're nearly too afraid to acknowledge that things are going well for fear that (laughs) that everything's gonna stop you know yeah that you jinx it yeah and for for me the the virtues was genuinely one of the best dramas I've seen in a long time um, I just thought it was so tonally perfect and obviously beautiful performances from yourself and Helen Bean and Mark O'Halloran and Stephen Graham um, and if, so like what was it like working with those kind of powerhouses and then along with Shane Meadows then just kind of little cherry on top on top of all of those amazing people to be around. Oh. <laughs> um. It was it was a proper family, you know. We had spent months um, workshopping those characters and finding finding those dynamics that I feel resonated with people, you know, with audiences that they they really connected, I suppose, to the truth. And everyone kind of saw either a bit of themselves in in those characters or someone that they know, um, and you know when I was in the factory in Dublin, we used to take scenes from like, this is England and workshop them. So to be then in a Shane Meadows production sat with Stephen Graham, it was it, like every now and again, your brain would go, oh my God, is this happening? And then you you know sit back into it. But for that, it was be, like, you know, I've never experienced anything since because we shot it chronologically and the story like we had scripts, but we were never, we were never, you know, tied to those. It could always, it could loosely always uh, change um, given the, the, if the tone kind of shifted in one scene to the next. And I think that's what makes Jane just so magical is that he's, he's open to that, to surrendering to, uh, to for the moment, you know, to, to see what happens and, and it's almost like, you know, you can tell if it's like in, in the middle, if a scene is kind of going a bit eggy, that it's either not going to make the cut because it doesn't work or because it's not needed. You know, so we were never felt pressured on trying to get it right. It was just trying to make it feel real. And he's all about the truth. So for me, that was like, it was the most kind of cathartic thing I've ever done. I felt like it was like this coming of age moment for mm. me you know to to have this experience and to tell a story that I don't feel like Irish audiences have seen attempted yeah agreed for fear that you fuck it up <laughs> because there's so much there's it's, so much and it was handled with such care as well yeah. it really was because I think so many things as you say you can mess it up like so many people maybe do attempt it or fail miserably mm. or you know aren't trusted with it or don't trust themselves with it because it is so sensitive yeah. and um 
and so relatable for a lot of people and I just thought like that it was just the tone was so perfect and it was yeah it was handled beautifully so it must have been quite satisfying to shoot it chronologically because that's so unusual yeah no it was and it was it was exciting because you felt like you'd proper ownership over your characters because as Jane said he's like I don't know what you're going to do in this scene let's just see what's going to happen yeah um, neither do I neither do I so um yeah and and like the fact like the the resources that I was given leading up to it like I met w- women who had lost their kids through different circumstances and Shane let me go on those go to those meetings um by myself or with one of the producers and then you know take from that what I needed and then report it back to him it was never it, it so it, I felt like I had complete ownership over that character and that character's narrative and it was a, it was at the time when the repeal conversation was just beginning to happen oh wow and you had such strong opinions from from both sides that I'm not going to lie that I wasn't going home and I shitting it thinking you know this is a you're going to be telling a story of something that has is incredibly emotional for for a nation you know and and then when the show came out the eighth had been had had been repelled you know repealing and it was really nice to, <laughs> to know yeah. that you know that they had that you know the, the amount of messages and stuff that I got of people who felt that they were in that same situation and, and I think there's a part of me that finds acting and film and tv such a magical thing because it's it's losing yourself in another character and to have a character where you felt like you were you were giving a voice to women that hadn't been heard before exactly yeah kind of representing those unheard voices and mm. untold stories and stuff well you did it beautifully um mm. and so did the kind of prep for um kind of that as you said that research of chatting with mothers and stuff kind of help you in your preparation for um Ursula and Cam with horses because um she has a little boy in that jack or is that am I got the timeline wrong again I feel like I'm no wrong. that was so so Cam with horses came came later yeah I had done a film in in Ireland called Drummer and the Keeper um, and had consulted with Autism Ireland back then. So, because, you know, Jack in in Camelot Horses mm. um, is nonverbal and in Nick, Nick Rowland, the director on it, we consulted with um, Autism Ireland and had set me up with um, a couple of representatives there and one woman in particular who had... A very similar experience like Ursula was someone who was trying to go through third level education while raising a young boy by herself and so you know what we were able to speak um, in private and just talk about more so just the battles of how solo parenting how that how that experience is as opposed to you know the as opposed to the disability in itself it's more the, the experience that she was going through and the struggles that she personally felt and so it was it was having a really honest conversation with her and she was you know it's that's for me is like such a an amazing opportunity as an actor to have those conversations and just mm. understanding people more you know Absolutely. And I think um, because your role in Come With Horses um, led you to get nominated for a BAFTA and an IFTA for Best Actress in Supporting Roles. So congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but I know before, just before the world started shutting down, we were supposed to have a Cam With Horses um, screening and Q&A uh, in Irish from London. But I was lucky enough to have gotten to see it uh with the bfi film festival a few months beforehand and i remember oh. just sitting there and just being so blown away by kind of little rural ireland being represented on the big screen as like this gritty kind of modern mm. even like w- modern western-esque kind of film yeah. 
Um, and I just thought I just thought it was a really cool kind of fresh perspective of like Irish film. Yeah. Uh, but then as well, I thought like Ursula and Jack brought a really lovely lightness to it because it is quite a dark kind of tough film to watch at times. Yeah, that and I feel like that that is needed. We can't just always sit in the dark. There has to be there has to be light, you know, where that where there is cracks, it lets the light in. And I feel like Ursula is the light in that story. She's that emotional heartbeat that you you need arm to to fight for. Otherwise, he's not he's not fighting for anything and there's nothing, there's no jeopardy within the story. So I loved how Joe Murtha and um, the writer had taken Colin Barrett's uh, short story and had kind of taken that character and really expanded upon. Yeah, it's beautiful. It really is. So if you haven't seen it, cause I know it was kind of came out around uh, an awkward time of cinemas opening and closing. So if any listeners haven't seen it, definitely do go and check it out but after cam then you went back to tv um to if i'm right for raised by wolves um with uh with wrigley scott directing well i know he's directed the first two episodes anyway but i really want to know what that moment of when you found out you got a tv show with wrigley scott was like because i imagine that was pretty mind-blowing it was I was in Ireland in a hotel in Dublin about to start filming um, The Last Right. And I, yeah, I just kept, I, I literally put like a, a, there was a probably a hole in the carpet from when I was just walking up and down and jumping on the bed. And then every now and again, I just reread the email just to make sure that I hadn't suffered some sort of knock to the head and I was making this up. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, like I had never gone through like the American um this was kind of like my first American job but yeah it was you know it was it was shot in Cape Town so I'd never heard of anything like test offers before where you you don't know if you have the job until the offer has to be accepted it's a, it was a weird and I remember I was working with Michael and Mikel uh, Houston, who's who played uh, Daniel in as the lead in <laughs> the last right, and he's like, I oh, know, you know, I, I had you know, test offers. You do about twenty of them before you kind of land the gig. And I was like, oh, all right. So this was just before I'd found out that I got it. And then the next day, I woke up and found out that I got. And he's like, what? That was your first test. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it isn't, yeah, my mad, isn't it? <laughs> um, but yeah, and it was funny because the character was originally meant to die in season one. Um, after and the first episode, just like how can we kill off this? Well, yeah, no, it was the first. So I, I landed over in in Cape Town in uh, just after the Christmas of so it started twenty twenty, no twenty nineteen. Oh gosh, everything's blank. Yeah, twenty nineteen, and uh, so Ridley was directing the first block, and I was terrified. Like I, I was so excited, but like. There's no, but I doubt I was terrified. I was like, don't, do not mess this up. You're about to go work with your hero. Um, and we shot the first episode and uh, we had a week off. And in that week, I got a phone call from Aaron, who is the series creator and Ridley's team to say that, would you mind? Um, we need we need to chat to you on, on Zoom. Um, we need to talk about your character and I was like oh that's it they're gonna, she's gonna be dead in episode two they've, <laughs> they've looked to the rushes <laughs> and yeah. said, no <laughs> the mullet was a mistake yeah <laughs> um and you yeah, brought they, mullets back me by the way I brought them <laughs> they're all your fault <laughs> the mullet never left <laughs> and they said um we don't want to kill your character off how do you feel about that and would you do you want to stay on the show um and this is just after she, we just for, we hadn't shot anything past the second episode. So obviously, you know, it would it would need to change, mm. uh, and so they they changed the scripts. Wow! So I I, I it, that injected me with that confidence of kind of going, okay, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I think That's it's amazing. You, yeah, you you can't help but have imposter syndrome. Like I'm a I'm a girl from Mullingar, and I'm on the set of Ridley Scott's TV series. You can't help but kind of go how. How did I end up here? <laughs> Absolutely. But as you know, you have to back yourself, you know, because you're there, you are there for a reason. And, and, uh, and, you know, people obviously really like working with you and, and you create some, you produce some really great stuff. So 
Penguins. People, people are seeing it. <laughs> but but with Raised by Wolves, um, you do you do quite a lot of training. Um, and uh, I know obviously you started with boxing the head off uh, people in <laughs> virtues. But um, what's the what's the kind of stunt work and training like with Raised by Wolves? And also that kind of continues into other stuff like you're with Guy Ritchie with the Wrath of Man as well so that's yeah. kind of been a consistent throughout some of your work as well my character I would love to have to do more stunts with her it was like I did I did a couple of stunts actually this season which was great fun um but we you know we were offered like a trainer and gym access and like these guys are amazing at what they do um so you can't help but kind of go right you know, I'm in a brand new, I'm in a brand new country um, where they're, they're, they're so into the outdoors in Cape Town. It's like, you know, everyone just goes for a hike for the crack in the morning. And you're like, look, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, well, you know, the, the mountains there, the, the food is amazing. Um, so, and for me, it's, it's having some sort of routine when you're not what feels like in your own natural environment so you know to have an outlet like exercise to kind of decompress after a day of filming or before going into filming so that you feel like you can kind of get out of your head and into your body and it's just I suppose it's that the classic thing that we all say of like trying to be present but for me that does make me feel present and um, I'm never I'm not really one to sit still and um, that's why I'm really shocked about this week and how well I'm doing. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it just, it's, you know, if you're given the opportunity to try and get in the best shape you can be and you've got the resources that people are are giving, just, just take it, you know? Absolutely. Um, well, in your most recent cinema release, Sensor, you're not necessarily boxing the head off anyone but you are kicking ass in a mainly male environment um dealing with material with where women are either damsel in distresses or just horror victims um and looking across the board of all of your characters uh you do play kind of fantastically independent um women who have their wits about them um so mm -hmm. when you look for kind of your next next projects do you look for roles like that or like is it important for you to play women that are you know represented in a empowering strong way I hate the word empowering but you know that kind of like in like in uh, Wrath of Man with Dana she you know she can fairly hold her own you know <laughs> um it depends on what, like, sometimes if the character isn't there on the page, but you know that you can bring something new to it. Um, and you probably find that as well when you, you, I think things have changed in the, in the last kind of two years, but when you used to read things like The Girlfriend, and that was their thing. That was it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's all. That defined them as the girlfriend or the wife. And, um, and you're like, okay, well, what? Well, who is she yeah um so you start to inject all this other these other layers into into it but what what sensor had um is that prano had created this such a magnificent multi-layered anti-hero but was a hero of her own story um and a, a woman as well you know i'd never kind of read a character that um represented something and someone that you can't help but like because she is not trying to be liked um and also it's just ex the exploration of psychological distortion and repressed memory it, I suppose anything that is is exploring the, the human psyche I'm, I'm just always fascinated by um and I, because I've been asked a lot that recently, it's like, you always, like, you seem to be, you seem to explore a lot of tortured characters, but I don't see them as, as tortured. And I don't see them as a, a, like, obviously strong women. I think it's just what makes them strong. You know, what it's, it's women, I feel like 
are less defined previously by their actions. They never had agency in their own stories. They were always there. They were justified kind of by the, the men in it, you know, and their narrative was they never pushed their own narrative, if you know what I mean. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, in Censor, she is literally pushing the narrative along. She's in every single frame. And um, a lot of the time we don't know what it is that she's thinking on, and she doesn't even know what she's thinking. And you have to read into so much of it um, and to be given a character like that and to represent, you know, like I said about this psychological distortion that we haven't really seen portrayed before, especially by a female in a story and present mm. that to an audience was so enticing. And I think that it's it's finding it's finding something in characters or finding a story that people would not imagine that you're going to go do and try and prove them wrong in 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 doing it. Definitely. And how did you find stepping in and out of your character in Censor? Because I imagine it was quite taxing at at, at points. It it was more so trying to get the um, um the most amount of sleep. I found. Because you, what I can't do is I can't really turn my brain off after filming. Because mm. you've spent the whole day almost not being yourself. That you're given us that option at night or that that opportunity in the evening to to switch off. But then you're kind of coming back into being Neve, and Neve wants to catch up on uh, talking to her friends or family. And so you feel I, what I found was I just wasn't really getting enough sleep. So when that gets compromised, is your your choices gets fewer. So you have to, re- like, luckily, I had so much time with Prano over Skype at weekends beforehand. So I wrapped Raised by Wolves on the Monday and by that Friday, I was filming in Leeds with Censor. So, but luckily I had so many months of, of research packed into that character and spoke thoroughly with Prano about the emotional journey that, that Enid was going on so that we could pinpoint at each moment whereabouts these cracks were going to begin to show. Um, but yeah, I I would have loved to have said, you know, I'm ah, sure, look, you know, you just turn it off at the end of the day and it's all good. But I find that if you care about, if you really care about the work you're doing, you, it's, it's really hard. And I think it gets easier when you have family, like a, an immediate family, when you have kids, because you're forced to, to switch off. But when you're given the opportunity to really sit in and sit with these characters, what I find is I kind of overindulge that. And then, because it's just easier then to like turn up the next day because you're already there. Oh, definitely. And you you, you really, ha- you have to, as weird as it's, as kind of, you know, pretentious as it sounds, you, you do have to shake it off and, and step out of it because, you know, as actors, like, as you said, you, you love taking on a new character and representing another person so that can really easily kind of start blending in like even mm. subconsciously so just to like like that be keep looking after yourself and getting your sleep yeah. or doing as you said your exercise and that kind of thing because well it's like a reset isn't it mm. and I kind of experienced that before with other characters and I'd, and that's how that that character of Enid has this reset I mean myself and Prano talked about that is that the idea that she's always she's not been her true self since she was a kid. So she's always been this other person. So we talked about is, is, is the Enid at the end her true self or is that, or is that a different version of, of her? And she did this physical reset, which was kind of almost like she's trying to crack, um, crack her exterior in order to, to be present again in her body. And there was all these kind like of takes. Stick. Like a glow stick, yeah. And then because then when you see in the edit, like she's put in these sound effects and you you really feel like you're inside Venus's head. It's 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 very claustrophobic, but in that wonderful um thriller way. Like I find that this is a psychological thriller set within a horror as opposed to it being a straight laced horror. There's so much, there's so much layers to this story and I can't wait to see it on the big screen and and see the the, like she's injected so much I know I feel like she's injected so much history Mm. in in that movie with just all these little little nuances and 
yeah I'm excited to see it definitely I think like even seeing your character when like when she smiles it was nearly like a different mm. person you know what I mean it was it, it was really transformative and did you have to do a lot of um horror research yes I did um Soprano sent me like a drop box of a load of video nasties and I spent a weekend watching <laughs> taking notes and it's just it's some of the stuff is is quite funny yeah. you know you're kind of going like you have to laugh you have to laugh and then other stuff is just it made you feel a bit sick and mm. like there was ho- cannibal holocaust is a movie it's um set in the amazon of these kind of backpackers that get lost and there's all these cannibals trying to kill them and but they they use animal violence in it they 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 sacrifice this turtle but it's it's real life they actually did it on screen oh my. and that physically made me sick um good god but got the opportunity to speak with an actual film censor and and you know pick her brain about working at that time and just the different just the, the experiences that she'd gone through because you always kind of see you know classification 18 and you just think it's a governing exactly that's what I was gonna say yeah. like it's actually it's such a fresh perspective I thought of mm. that kind of um like as you said it's more of a thriller in a genre setting but it is such a fresh perspective because like people there are people who sit in a room who need to decide whether it's 18s or r-rated or whatever you know and you just yeah. don't, you never think about them um no. so and they're was, you know they're there to sense what like what gives them the right to censor mm. and why why are they censoring certain things and there's these you know parallel motifs in this of, of is Enid censoring something that's happened to her and choosing not to to see it so there was like while I like Prano was a magical director she's amazing um and she allowed me to kind of make up my own mind about what it is had actually happened to her sister so and I, I think what what this film does is you kind of it leaves you going back and investigating and really thinking about it it's not hammering answers over the head but it's also not doing that thing of going leave it up to you you know you decide yeah. what the ending is it's yeah I think though it sounds like between virtues and and censor and I'm sure like a few others along the way it sounds like you've been graced with having so many kind of collaborative uh, experiences which is amazing sometimes people kind of just get handed handed it and you know point and shoot kind of thing but it's it sounds really cool that you've gotten like to really kind of collaborate collaborate with the creators of what you're doing and become a creator of it as well and not just you know be cast in it which has got to be pretty cool yeah no I have been very very lucky to have worked with as you said collaborative directors and I find that the directors who's it's all about trust really if they trust they trust their actors and trust that the choices that they're making and the journey that that actor has taken with that character is as truthful and honest as it should be for the story you know the characters are, should always so you're always serving the story and and that's the main thing and you have to find you, you are like a lawyer to that character you're mm. the only one who's getting paid to figure out and and research the actions that your character takes you're justifying its actions and so you will defend its actions and stand up in court and go this is why they're they're Mm. doing this and and find no doubt in it so you just take it take it like that and it's all like Michael Smiley said it to me on the set of of uh, censor it's just commit and embrace commit to the Mm. moment and just embrace the changes and when Mm -hmm. you do that is if you keep it as simple as that you will not be driving yourself crazy like it's easier said than done but just you know commit and embrace and do you have kind of over your last few projects have you it could be changing all the time but do you have a kind of a preparation process of like okay I'm finished with that project now I'm although sometimes they blend in to to one when you're doing two at a time but do you have that kind of like kind of preparation process do you do anything particular for before any character 
Ah, I just give a glance at the script, don't I? And just go just for it. Give it a go. <laughs> Who's this? Where am I? I just search the character's name and just see what she's Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> Put it into the search. Um now obviously you're you're you you're reading it. It's it's always I always it's always great because you a lot a lot of the time you're reading the script at the time you're probably doing the casting. So you the first time you're trying to read it, you're just trying to read it so you understand what what the story is about so that when you go and do the tape you have you have a good grasp of mm. what's going on in the story but you know what I do is that I've after feed, reading it for the first time is just take down my initial thoughts because if you eventually do that project you'll never be looking at that story with fresh eyes ever again and you'll never get that opportunity because you'll always have your own um I suppose, inner view of what the story is about when you begin to get into it. Mm, you know, like other voice it could come in later down the line. Where well, no, your... it's just like, because you're never going to be able to, to, unless you got you got hit in the head from from making it to watching it on the big screen, you're never watching it for the, you're never watching it fresh. Mm. Um, that's why whenever someone, a lot of people are saying like, Sensor really freaks me out and it scared me and I'm like really because <laughs> because you because I know but that's the thing was like when I first read Sensor it scared me yeah and I went back on my notes and I was like holy crap yeah no it, it really did scare me what scared me about the character is that I didn't know what she was thinking and I didn't know what she was going to do next and that frightened me and so and unnerving it's so unnerving and it's terrifying because she doesn't know what she's going to do um but it's it's a lot of it is just doing the answering those questions that you can only answer as the character like what scares them what drives them um what what are their goals mm. and just making them taking them from the page and making them three-dimensional for for you nice and it obviously goes without saying it's been um hasn't been the normal list year um in regards to award ceremonies and premieres and all that kind of stuff you've kind of experienced those sometimes from the comfort of your own home mm. um so what has that has that been quite disorientating kind of having this somewhat odd kind of virtual introduction into you know the business in the, in that kind of sense of like awards and you know all that kind of how has that been yeah, it's well. It's been it's quite handy because you don't have to like stand and be in a pair of heels all night. <laughs> you can wear your slippers. Yeah. Wear, like genuinely, I didn't have any shoes on for the Baptists. I was sat, <laughs> I was sat in a dress, sitting on uh, at my kitchen table. Um, yeah, we do, we all love a party, don't we? Mm, That's yeah. what it is. Like I find awards. It's not the awards. It's just it's a celebration of film and TV. Um. And I feel like the, the awards are just the, the icing on the cake. But I feel like having something that where, you know, we acknowledge the work that has been created that year and we can all come together in a in a in a space where we're all like everyone loves to get dressed up. I love getting dressed up. So mm. and and be with your peers, like for me, like to the year I presented at the Baptism was part of BAFTA Breakthrough. Like I was in the room with Joaquin Phoenix and Robert De Niro and these are people that I you just like they, they it's that they don't didn't seem real until mm. you see them in a room and then you go oh my god yeah that's crazy look I can <laughs> reach out and touch them <laughs> I shouldn't but I will no. <laughs> um yeah it's, I just can't wait for everything to kind of hopefully open back up again and we can just be in in rooms again because it just yeah, there's just there's something so and it's so nice to see Can you know seeing everyone mm. there and um and you know, and Sensor is gonna have a screening in Galway I believe as well yes uh, in Galway Film Flash so hopefully that's because I know they're um doing some online and doing some in person. Uh, but hopefully censor can be in person so people can get the because I think with like thrillers and horrors like if you're surrounded it's kind of the same with comedy like you're always encouraged to laugh when you hear other people laughing or like with horrors it, mm. it just always is, is better when you can really feel that tense kind of atmosphere in the air or when someone gets really scared and they just start laughing to ever like yeah that well, always seems to happen as well I forgot I was like I forgot what it felt like to be in a cinema I was in Cape Town and we went to go see all the cast we went to go see um 
a quiet place too and you forget it's you know it's like a, it's immersive theater you're in you know in the, they call it the pictures they call it you know mm. it's it's being in a space with other people having having that shared experience and I think I'm very excited to, to see censor with with an audience because I haven't had that experience yet I've only just read comments online and and had the feedback from from Sundance but it'd be so nice to actually be in a room and just feel 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 how people ha- are, are responding to to the story definitely in Quiet Place too what a what a film to to come back into the cinema to Oh, it's so good. So good. Oh, Emily Blunt. I love her so much. So great. And Killian Murphy popping up there. Oh, my so God. He's job. so he's amazing. And he's got a massive beard in it. Yeah. And did you go with your your kind of Cape Town family? It seems that like yeah. with Raised by Wolves, like you guys have such a it seemed like such a close family, which I'm yeah. sure has been really great, especially over the last year, probably not getting to see your own. No, they we, like I really looked out on that production, which is having such a lovely cast and um especially being so far away from home especially this year because we couldn't you can't just have people come out and visit and you can't mm. fly home so you really you really do you really depend on on each other especially um especially if the subject matter is quite heavy that you're dealing with on set and everyone knows everyone kind of especially with a with a show like that that has many many characters and kind of each character it either goes through quite, like we what we realized is like all the characters in the show are always in a state of survival <laughs> it's not like that's what we always felt we're like why are we like so sore intense, intense at the end of the yeah. day because you're like oh yeah they're always just trying not to die <laughs> yeah exactly so then you're all stepping out of it and shaking it off together then so that's quite nice yeah and we're um, all in the same bubble as well and doing yeah living living in each other's pockets and Neve, listeners can also keep an eye out for you on their TV screens as well as their cinema screens um, in Channel 4's new drama, Deceit. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so Deceit is a four part drama for Channel 4 and it follows the investigation into the Rachel Nicole murder that took place in 1992 and the honey trap that was. That was put in place to lure out Rachel's killer. Um, and I play Detective Constable Sadie Byrne, who works as an undercover officer for the Metropolitan Police. And she's recruited by Keith Peller to take part in a honey trap operation. Um, and so she goes undercover to, to lure out Rachel's killer. And so it follows that character over a four part drama. Amazing. Well, I'm really looking forward to having another drama to binge. We can't wait to see what's next for you. And we wish you all the best with your future successes. And thank you so much for coming on to chat to me today. Thanks, Neve. Thanks for having me on. It's been a lovely chat. No problem, Neve. <laughs> Neve. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Neve. See you soon. See you, love. Bye. Thanks again to Neve for coming on to chat to us today and thank you all for listening. And just a little reminder, Irish Film London is a non-profit organisation. So if you did want to become a member or donate, please do have a look on our website to do so. And while you're on the website, definitely check out our new selection of the summer shorts, only £5 or free if you're a member. Keep up to date with all things IFL by following us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. And a final thank you to the Irish Emigrant Support Programme and Culture Ireland who have been fantastic supporters of our work. Garmila Mahagut. This podcast is produced by me, Neve Brannigan. We're edited by Owen Bill Cliff and our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. See you soon.